abort message in the middle of handling all this stuff. And you've got to be able to stop any of the incoming, identify anything you've got floating, close that messages that you've got pending. It, you know, it, the internet driver works with the Santa 2 protocol. The, uh, we've, we've, we finally made our, we made our way up to the top of the chain that finally defined our interface points. Again, here's the magic. The resident points everything else to the, live, the tags. What are we going to do in this visualization? of it to set up as a library, so I give it a structure. It does that for me, interface, which is finally to what our top level API is. Now, in addition to that, so going back a step, so there's also optionally called Vector 68K, which is a mean 1,000 compatible API layer, strictly speaking, under Amiga OS 4. Unfortunately, you compile to 68K API in the PowerPC. OS 4 has all kinds of problems. No, no. From my standpoint, you could say, again, yeah, I'm not supporting it. I new on the block, and there's to talk to you because you're a brand new kind of device. There's no way to have the 68K tags if you don't have 68K. And they're kind of close to uh, the the extern uh, which then looks like this. Uh, that's not taking me to the actual side of the actually. Here, uh, 68K interface, which ends up being a bunch of stub calls, which will actually call the PowerPC versions. So that's what you end up taking and doing is setting up this, uh, this weirdness. Now this, this is just the prototypes for it. It doesn't set up the, uh, the actual links to it.
but it doesn't, it, it'll never get used with Roadshow right now because it doesn't get, it, it didn't know about it when it was created. Must have been all of the changes. Yes, trying to. The problem is the MBUFs. The internal man, the internal memory management. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's, that's what screwed up. From the old BSD stuff. Yeah, yeah, 128 byte memory packets. That have to be stacked and organized. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, which is which is no wonder why the you know every other device driver, Ethernet driver I've ever seen doesn't even attempt to use newer style typing. It just goes to the default. Some of them don't even check to see if they exist. You know, they just assume that the copy to and from base functions will always exist. And as when Olaf and I were going through finding this out, he didn't even realize, probably from so many years of looking at it, that when you when you actually open up the call, when, when Roadshow does the open and starts that further negotiation, which I'll, I'll go into, it passes pointers to functions that you're supposed to be able to call to say, copy this for me. But we expect that those pointers are PowerPC native that they're directly addressable and they're not. So you can't use them. So it gives you pointers to these functions, but you can't use it that way. Because it's 68K pointers, and you don't want to go through the emulation layer to make that jump again, especially thousands of times a second. Well, nobody's going to work to work it through the fix it. Not as well. I was back and forth with them for three, four weeks just to try to understand what was possible. Which is which is why the implementation I have runs like 40 percent faster, and it's just touching the edge. We get the rest of it aligned. Jamie, when would we have the ability to take a look? At it? When is this going to be published for us to kind of crawl through it? Um, the actual. Uh, the actual Ethernet driver template system here is one of the templates that will be released with my AVD software. One of So you're making other driver templates? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Application templates, device drivers, Boopsy classes, libraries, basically every subcomponent you would want to know how to write for within Amigo OS, you need a template for. You need a good guide, for one thing, a good example. But you also need something that just works. Right. that you can jump in and start adding your bits to. There's absolutely no reason to write all of this more than once. If it's done properly and nothing changes within the OS, this whole resident system and everything should not have to be figured out and debugged from, from new code from scratch again and again and again and again. It's ridiculous. This has to happen this way. Here's one that works. Start from there. Cool. So. Okay. Should be a class right now. All right. So we got as far as the 68K <laughs> layer, which is in here somewhere. I won't actually go farther look at that. Then we'll just assume 68K is time. not to be used.
So that's it. And, and really, I don't know of anything else that you would likely need to do. But if you needed to do some specific magic with your library that, that one time when it was open, you could track it in there. Uh, and correspondingly, you could release it uh, with, the, uh, with the opposite call. So in this case, it's very simple. The obtain function just increments the count. Yep, um, I've been opened by one guy, I'm now one. Later on, when it's released, with a closed, closed device, it would decrement the count, making sure the count doesn't get below zero. run into some weirdness with that. Seems like multiple things want to close. Not, not everybody was doing it right. The same number of opens didn't equal the same number of closes. I had to make sure to put code in there that it was going to be, I'm asking to be closed. I'm not at zero. Not, not that sure. negative one. Yeah. Because if it rolls over, then the OS goes, oh, it's open by 255 people or maybe 65,000. And it just never free it. You know, that's the worst that will happen. And unfortunately, it just won't come out of memory. So the next thing that Roadshow, in this particular case, or any, any of your, your client thing would do is call your open call and your manager again. So here, it passes, it makes this manager call, and, and the prototype for it is going to pass it, uh, the pointer to your uh, self. So it's pointing it, this is your pointer to the device manager interface structure. That's the first thing, which looks like this as our interface data, and here's the actual, this basically, this basically is the layout of all the, all the APIs. So open, obtain, release, right, pull in there. open, close, open, right. So this is the prototyping for what the actual calls look like. That's why we have the device management structure here, and then it passes the IO request, the unit number, and any additional flags. So this is, this is open. So the primary thing every device driver is going to want to do at this point is set up, set up its unit information. Now, in this case, it is set up to, to expect that it's going to handle more than one unit, that it wants to do it multitasking, so it's more than, more than one process. So it's going to go ahead and set up the structure, initialize the structure, and fire off a separate process. So that's what we're doing here. Call. And the first thing I've got to do in this particular case is this, this is for the Ethernet driver, uh, is I need to make sure that my, the message passed to me is actually the one that I, I need. And the only way to find that out is to check it against the, uh, the size of the Santa 2 structure. Now, don't get caught and follow the documentation because it gets this wrong. This is where the, there is an old value in here that used to say, check the length to see if it's greater than or equal to 20. But the size of the structure isn't 20. So don't do that. Which is, which is why I always check it against the size of the actual true IO Santa 2 request structure. Which version of that structure? This is the version from the, from the OS. This yeah, is from the SDK. That's the current. This is the current one, right. But the documentation used a fixed number yeah. when it did the check, and that's what was wrong. Which documentation do you read? The, on the, the wiki for the uh, Santa 2 Rep 7. Oh. Okay. No, because it's... it's no, no one filed the budget report. No one <laughs> to who's, the last, who's the last person to actually do one of these drivers externally? Hang on a second, though. How can you be guaranteed that this structure is going to be in terms of its size? That's a very good question. Because IO, because because exact IO, right, it doesn't have a field that says, uh, you know, unique client ID or anything like that. So I get, I get why over time people have gone ahead and said, well, check the, check the size of, check the size <coughs> of the structure that's being passed, right? right? That makes sense. But there's no guarantee it's going to be unique. No, but you can do further checks on there. Okay. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that is, that is very true. 
uh, you know, is it going to end up being, is it possible to be passed another custom message packet to your device that ends up being the same size? And also, you'll notice the check is saying, well, is it at least this size? Is it greater than, is the length that I got out of, so the length field populated in the message structure, which tells you how big the rest of the extended message actually is, is it at least as big as this? And it has to do it this way in the code because you don't have any idea if the structure will be added to it. Yeah, over time, right. Standard over time. Yeah, same right. Standard. So if you, otherwise your device driver would break right there. It would just say, well, it's, it's no longer this particular size. But, you know, so we, so that's, that's, the, that's the best we can do right at that level to check to see, we got a message, is it the right kind? Well, is it at least the size that we expect it to be? So at least the memory we're going to go look at next is theoretically there. So oh, I see. This is more of a safety thing rather than actually verifying that the I/O request is is, is the standard two request. Yeah, that's just, right. Just, just, so you're not often in the weeds looking at storage. You're not supposed to. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, uh, that's the top uh, thing. You should protect and make sure the memory is actually there. But you see, at this point, if you're getting bad data, it's all over anyway. That's that's, that's true. Yeah. You're being lied to, and it's it's, it's going to end poorly. <laughs> 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 There's no checks on checks on here. And the contract uh, basically started with that open device call. If they called you with open device, you hope Roadshow or whatever it is, whatever the stack is, whatever, yeah. gave you whatever the parameters for your command. And you never know if it's really the parameters. And that goes for any command. You hope it's the right stuff. Right? Yes. There's no way to double check. Once you get the command, you can't. There's no verification step. Right, well, he said, just on the basis of what the command is. The yeah. command's the right command, everything yeah. else is what it does. But on, on most of our devices, you, you do the length check. Just kind of, because it, it's quick and... You, you at least, at the absolute least, you want to make sure that the fields you're expecting to look at next yeah. are there in yeah. the message. Or and not on the file side. Yeah, minimum, minimum viable size. So now that we have verified our minimum viable size, it is at least possibly a struct IO SANA2 request packet. We need to set up a pointer as of that type so we can further examine it. So this is what we do here. Um, and then we can look further. Now this uh, is obtaining a field in the IO SANA2 request, which is, is custom. Now we're getting into the SANA2 protocol specifically. As a generic device uh, layer, your, your open call is going to vary right here. The, uh, if this is a different type of device, well, it obviously, at, right at this point, we're checking, starting to check the size of that, that packet is where you're being specific about what you expect to see. You know, everything else that we've looked at up to this point is reusable code for any type of device. Uh, so here's where it be, starts to become an Ethernet driver uh, for, this, uh, for this template and not any other kind of driver. Or, or more specifically, it's not even an Ethernet driver. It is a SANA2 driver. Because there is a distinction between that. So you could, you could create a SANA2 driver um, that communicated to absolutely anything. It could be serial or parallel or Ethernet or Wi-Fi or anything on the other side of it. And this is, the SANA2 is the only thing we have as, you know, which is your, your standard Amiga networking architecture. It's the only communication protocol we have to go between devices expected to connect to a network uh, of some kind and any client. So more specifically, Roche. So really, that's that's where we're at right here. We don't even know it's Ethernet hardware down at the bottom later yet. This is all just reaching from generic device setup to SANA 2 device, right at this point. And uh, just to interject the, the SANA, SANA 2 standard there so that you can run multiple stacks at the same time. Yes. At the, on the same hardware. So I can run Envoy and Roadshow at the same time, which I do. 
Yeah. And it works. They do. And it works. And the driver has no problems with that. I just go. And yeah. it's totally cool. <laughs> you using a, a Parnet offering for your uh, uh, endpoint connections? Or what, do you, what kind of hardware are you connecting at the endpoint? Oh, uh, uh, the Ethernet. Oh, Ethernet? Yeah. With the same with what the same cable. No, it's just, it's just software. Oh, you're just on, on the exact same hardware. Yeah, yeah. That's what I do on my sound. Because yeah. the Ethernet driver in there, I can open, you can open it multiple times. Right. So Envoy opens it, Rocher opens it, and they both throw packets on, and they both pull packets on. Right. And yeah. it's multiplex perfect. So, yeah. 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 And it, it does work. It's, it's quite fascinating. Hmm. Does it work on Envoy in these days? Does it use different machines? Yeah. Well, they have to be a main machine. Well, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that is fine. And then it can print across to whoever to, you know. But it's nowadays, it doesn't matter so much because printers have Ethernet ports. So. <laughs> <laughs> like if, back when I had a, a serial connection to my printer, yeah, it made, it made all the difference. But it's still cool. But now I'm like, well, it, it's still cool for moving files, but then now I use SSH to move files, so its value is then boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I use SSH to move files everywhere now. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, why do I need Envoy? <laughs> Other than it looked really cool back then. I use SSH very extensively as well with all my connected machines, which is why I yeah. cry when I'm doing SSH connections back and forth between the Amiga and its existing drivers. The speed just, it just hurts me. Yeah, speed is annoying. Never do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you stop doing all of that software encryption and decryption in, in, with the CPU <laughs> software encryption, come on! Not when you've got hardware de decryptors on the, on the actual machine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Once we can actually reach them. Okay, so. Um, how, are we, how are we doing so far? Is this like uh, way too like deep level here. technical for, for what people want to do? Yeah, all this is actually the level we've played before. Huh? That's just played. Oh, yeah. Something can you I thought we'd stop at lunch. Yeah, are, are we close to that or we're just waiting for whatever comes in? We're waiting for the food. It's 12 o'clock. Right. You're waiting for the food or you want to do it at 12? Well, where, is the food here? That's the question. Anybody know? We'd have to ask uh, Brian. I'll go check. How do we know when it happens? <laughs> no, no the, the guys from the front would bring it back. Are we bowling or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Device driver. Device driver. Are we bowling or not? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Interrupt driver. Yeah, I wish it was always that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Some of these peripherals are pretty uh, arcade hardware. Those <laughs> mm -hmm. sit there spinning. <laughs> Is there? Are you there yet? Are you there yet? Are you there yet? Oh. oh, God. Yeah. I always wondered if we should add spin locks to the kernel. Because there's still some hardware out there that it don't. You stop it going completely out of control? Yeah. 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 It's just, they're not going away. These hardware guys are lazy. Hardware guys. <laughs> Give the, <clears throat> throw, throw the software developers a branch. Throw us a bone, for God's sake. Yeah. Put an interrupt line in there. It never fails. They, they take the easy way in. Well, that, but that's what lifted my ears up about the, yeah. the templates. That's one of the easy way out. We, we love that stuff. You should talk more oh, about that. But the uh, food history. Oh, good. All, oh, good great. Stuff. Excellent, 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 spot excellent spot to break. This is a layer. Did you want to go uh, down to the unit layer, or did you want to just stop at the device layer? So, uh, no, I should talk about the unit layer. Okay. Because uh, that's yeah, a lot of standard stuff. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's pretty much. Well, we'll do the unit layer, and then we'll do my stuff. Switch back to mine. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it depends on how much detail you want as far as like how to put out of the hardware and for, for the Ethernet driver or not. No, uh, it's not, not, yeah. It's not a recommendation. Like sauna, just my sauna, I just brought my SATA driver. Right, yeah. <laughs> so before we get to delve into the hardware of going one way, you can talk about the SATA, which is like yeah, because, right at this point. Because uh, I want you to stop at unit because that's exactly where I, I would start. What do you do? Yes. You don't know that yet. <laughs> and I need your PC too, because <laughs> I don't have a cable yet. If we're breaking, can I make a quick plea? 
Um, as is AmiWest tradition for this is now the third year in a row, I bricked my system. And uh, if anyone is in, thank you. If uh, anyone has uh, access to the beta server and a spare USB uh, key drive, and they would like to make me a, an AMI 22 to install USB so I can move and fix my phone, uh, I would be totally grateful. What's the oh, break? Huh? Well, basically what happened was is I went ahead and upgraded uh, to the latest kernel in the ELF library. Uh, yes. And I'm getting DSIs like everywhere. And it is just, it's, it's a disaster. So I, I backed off the kernel and I did a warm restart because it was in this loop and it was filling. And I was like, well, that's no big deal. I'll just warm restart instead of cold. We'll pick up the new kernel. Except for whatever reason, it did a cold restart, which meant it has the newer ELF library and the old kernel now, so you're broken. Oh, uh, yeah. So I need to go back to an older ELF library. I can give you a copy of the text uh, from this if, if I, if Oh, no, that's okay. If I can, if I can, if it's bootable. It's, well, it's booting for me. Do you have your, your table with you? The table, yeah. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Oh, that looks fantastic. <laughs> and my, okay. the house so I, I guess we're going to break for lunch. Uh, an hour, is that good? An hour would be fine. Do we need any more? All right. <laughs> Start it back up again, please. That's it. Those are my bots. That's Croti Roma. Are they memory sticks? That's from this precise thing. Oh! Oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay, uh, how's your cameraman doing? Yeah, can't get okay over there? Okay, so I wanted to mention before we uh, got going again that we, we are recording this. So, if there's something that you want to say that should not be recorded, raise your hand or yell out, stop the camera, and then we'll do it. <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> because otherwise it'll get recorded and we don't want to go back and edit because it's horrible to go back and edit. Editing takes time. Yes, yes. And if, because everything's volunteer, so you know. You can, so if there's something that you don't want recorded and you want to rant on about something, then we'll turn off the camera for a while. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Jamie, you can uh, get back to the device driver. Bring them. Oh uh, yes, fascination of Amiga OS device driver development. It's fascinating. <laughs> it was certainly fun to figure out. Uh, so, all right. Well, we, where we left off, we were just we just completed the initialization of the actual uh, device library. It's loaded up into into RAM, and it's ready to be used. And we got our first open call from Client, which in this particular case versus is Brojo, or DC Magic Stack. And we got up to the point where we're looking at the very first message of this open call. And now this is Ethernet specific, but I'm going to glance over that for right now, read it the other thing. But uh, <coughs> I examine the, you examine the, uh, the Sanitude request on the open call, and you get this you get a very interesting buffer management system that you have to figure out. Now, I'll go through this in detail because you want to skip, skip part of what this is setting up and get right to where it actually sets up the unit. Uh, so at this point, we're going to just skip this buffer management concept, which is Sanitu specific. And we get into uh, allocating the, uh, the device itself. Okay, so let's see, we're checking. Uh, continue to the open without the uh, OS request, but we one fails to obtain the resources, so we skip using this unit. Okay, so, so we have the resources. Um, we check to make sure that the unit version is correct. There we go, so the unit mass. So this is all, this is all tracking which unit has been opened already. And, uh, and whether you know whether you're attempting to open it again, it handles that. So we need first allocation of some, some memory for the device unit structure. So this is where we are now 
taking and allocating our own structure for handling devices or the units. Uh, this is before, in the first part, you gave it a size of the structure to, for the auto init to allocate for you. And so you have your, you have that interface has all been set up as the library. Now you're off into doing your own thing at this point, rather. And so, so the idea with this framework is that it, it gives you a base, which is now the unit structure, which is going to hold all the information that you need to track for managing each connection to your hardware. So I allocate a, uh, uh, just a section of, of regular RAM, allocate type tags, share, they're, they're with value zero, so I get the block memory all zeroed out. And it is of size struct device unit. So device unit, we take a quick look at this. Uh, this is just, again, this is my structure for tracking the units themselves. It contains the, starting out like the device, it contains the base unit structure, which is operating system. Uh, it's coming from the OS, and it essentially holds a, an, an embedded message port and flags, pad, and the open count on there. So just like the device structure right above it here, just you know, was set up for you. This is your base device. This is a base unit, and we need a message port for every one of the units because, as I described before in the the overview, we're going to have two message ports communicating, one from the manager level, and then one for each one of the possible open unit processes, and that's how we're passing information around. So this is your smallest possible unit structure from the OS, just the message port, open count flags. And I extend that with uh, uh, my unit number and pointer to the device space. So these are convenient pointers from the, the unit pointing back to essentially its ownership. So the unit structure points back to the device structure and also a pointer to the process that will be what will run this unit and uh, then we have our process name and, and ending process, run state flags, and the machine type is also tracked at this level for convenience uh, and, of checking the machine type and run time, which could come into play with some, some units. So I have a copy here who is able to give it more easier access to the lower hardware there. And then again, as I've talked about before, here's a set of uh, library pointers for uh, all of the uh, different uh, libraries that I need to pull stuff from. In this case, now at the unit level, I need an access to non-volatile memory uh, for the Ethernet to pull environment variables from Ubu. Uh, so I added the uh, uh, NV base non-volatile library in there. Uh, ignore this iPress object. That does not work. <laughs> I don't know why. I was I wanted to set some external preferences that it would pick up from the disk to uh, uh, to set default behavior, uh, basically. Like um, uh, set, uh, manually setting the Ethernet speed. Uh, right now, the, the drivers are, are, they fully auto detect the connection speed and what you're connected to, and it'll lock to that speed. But if for some reason you've got some flaky connection with your switch, it doesn't like to lock to the speed you know it can run at. You want the ability to override that with something else. And this was, I was trying to use the uh, uh, press library. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure why it didn't work, but it just, it just didn't, it didn't pick it up. Uh, that was kind of a question I had. But, you know, so another approach would have been uh, to to probably get the, the raw environment variable. But I was trying for trying to pick up a little like XML structure of, of a full config file rather than just a raw environment variable setting. So, but anyway, there's some other ways to do it. But I did need to uh, pick it up. And the main reason for this is because this, again, is not an executable. It's going to jump into main where you can expect to get arguments and actually parse out command line arguments. I mean, in a typical, because there, as far as I know, there's no way to get Roadshow to pass arguments into the open call and say, I want to open this dot device with this and this and this tag to it, and it would do that. So you really you need to go outside of so you don't have the ability to parse the ARC VRC stuff to possibly pick up these flags. 
he needs some other way to do it. And so you've got to pick it up from externally. But again, this is specific only if you had a device driver that you needed to pick up some external information that the you know, user would set. So this method didn't work. I don't know. It might yet if I figure out, but I, I did a quick implementation on it, and that's, that's the last time I tried it. So I'm not sure what's wrong with that. Uh, so we can ignore that. Uh, timer structure in here, I need a timer. Uh, so open up the timer device and set that up. Uh, and then message ports and signal bits to be used uh, with, for the main client interface, begin I.O. and board I.O. So you have a message port for begin I.O., a message port for a board I.O., and then the sig bits that will be obtained for actually signaling them when messages arrive. Um, signals and signal bits to be used uh, to, to signal uh, the main loop of hardware events, transmit signal, receive signal uh, bits. And again, this is uh, maybe just specific to Ethernet. Uh, you know, your unit structure could definitely vary, uh, but a lot of this stuff would be common no matter what you were doing. You know, we'll see what Steve does for his stuff. It's probably dramatically different. But the, um, and then I have, uh, since, since the way that the, the TCP IP stack with Roadshow works, you have a queue of, of command read requests pended ahead of time. Uh, it's, it's really kind of a weird concept that way, but you, you, you start it up and it just throws all kinds of reads at you, anticipating that you'll fill them with something eventually. So you have a whole pending bunch of reads that come in, and you've got pending writes that come in off the hardware, and, and so I've got uh, some list structure handling for, uh, for that. That's, that's uh, something unique to, um, to all of I thought it was unique to Santa 2 protocol as a whole. Uh, I mean, because he prepares a bunch ahead of time. Yeah, because mm -hmm. because the packets are so relatively small yeah. and expensive, they, they just throw off a bunch of pending ones from the stack ready yeah. to go so yeah. that you don't, uh, I guess, to avoid contact switching. And, and but a lot of overhead of allocation. You don't want to be stop and wait, stop and wait, stop and yeah. wait. You want to have, yeah. like, and you can set that with the uh, roadshow. You can say I have 16. Ahead, I can have like or two and a half to six. Yeah, yeah, you can actually set. Yeah, uh, so you it's can do unique. some. You can do a little bit of fine tuning with that. Yeah, and uh, which I, I did play with um, a little bit. The uh, on on this on, on the Tabor on the H twelve point two hardware, I'm using like two hundred and fifty six. I think it's two hundred fifty six um, buffers for. Uh, read, read, read buffers and write buffers from the hardware. So, and then you're matching that up with a dynamic list of actual messages from the uh, um, from Roadshow. Yeah. But yeah, it has to do that. So you, you always end up with this pending list of reads, and they're generic because it doesn't know what they're for until you fill them in and then send it back again. And then internally, it does some magic and go, oh, that. Read that request or that response matches this request that I did earlier, but it starts out generic. This is really kind of weird, about it. so you gotta, you know. But it's it's done for speed efficiency. and efficiency. Yeah. yeah. Because otherwise you're wasting all kinds of cycles just trying to allocate the allocate to the, the other devices. You might not do this. You it's, might yeah. Do something it's, else. it's a similar concept to doing a uh, a task pool, yeah. right? So it's like instead of allocating a task and destroying a task again and again on something that is a very multitasking process, you create a pool of them up front and you just keep them and you just keep reusing them. You know, and, it, and logically, you release them back into the pool and then pick them back up again. But this is more of a, you know, a, a load and drain situation. Here's, here's more and as long as you've got them to come back. Because there's no way to respond with data coming in normally um, on, on your packet data from, from the uh, Ethernet hardware right. back to Roadshow without having <coughs> a read request you ready have to one respond. Buffer, X buffers, I should say, at the hardware level. Yeah. Usually a ring buffer or something. It's ring, yeah, it's ring buffer. Oh, okay, it's already in there. It is hardware ring buffer. It's limited. It's, it's limited, yeah, but you, so it, you have to match it back to Roadshow. So although you've got data, Pending, you know, it's like wham, all kinds of stuff came in, and it's right there in your in your, your ring pool. And 
in your, your buffer ring and you need to hand it back, but you need to be able to have a handle to hand it back with, or it has no idea, Roche has no idea how to put it back together. So the internal complexity of the TCP IP stack is immense. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on there. And, and with Roadshow implementation, even more so. It's, it's stuff that handles for you that, you know, like DHCP, it, it just, that's all above. You know, the driver, unfortunately, an Ethernet driver doesn't need to know that. The Ethernet driver does not handle dynamic host lookup. It, it doesn't assign IP addresses. And all of that layer is above you. No matter what people think. Yeah, no matter what people think. You know, the, the only address it might play with is the map, the actual hardware hardware map address. That that it's kind of responsible for. Which is a whole other issue on this question. So so okay, so so again, uh, mostly this is for you know tracking information, holding the library handles, um, provisioning for the message ports and the signals we need. And then this this transmit receive lists, I can see that applying to a lot of different devices. Because it's, it's, it's just a list handler for whatever type of messages you end up with. <coughs> so you could use that generically with whatever kind of, um, uh, as, as a cue for any of your transmits or receives. Uh, let's see what we have here. List pendings for, for one event. These this special handling um, events and orphan packets, other, you know, other weirdness that you have to keep track of. Uh, but we really get down to, yes, uh, there, here's these are the place the flags that I was trying to pull externally. And they get set so it auto-negotiates every time and it, you know, what it's supposed to default to in uh, terms of speed. Right now it just tries to, it, it always depends on taking it and getting a real answer from the hardware. It, it, it communicates right to the, through the Mac to the Phi and the phi communicates, you know, and does does its auto negotiation thing, figures out what speed it can run at. That's what the that's what the hardware sets up at that speed. So, with this driver, currently has no way to override that with a manual, which you shouldn't have to do if your hardware is correct and your switch is mm -hmm. correct or your hub or whatever you're connecting to the other end. But if you're trying to connect to some junky, flaky hardware, or maybe your cabling is a little twitchy or too long, you could end up not getting a proper negotiation. So, but the real answer to that, in my opinion, is fix your hardware. Replace your cable, get a proper switch, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But we try to provide a means to override, to force it, if possible. Uh, and then we get to, uh, this layer is another embedded structure of the unit hardware. Um, and this is additional Extended fields specific to the device implementation that should be added here. So this this again is just in, in the template a, a provision for adding uh, <laughs> further hardware specific uh, information. So I tried to ke keep that top unit structure fairly universal on, on the handling, and then this is where the, this is the hardware bits start to actually get into here. This is this is all for in this particular case. Um, well, just about any any of the Ethernet hardware. It's definitely for the Ethernet hardware on that. So, uh, just the, so the last thing I really wanted to show before handing it over to Steve for for that is the allocation kicking off the process. Because that should be that should be universal. Okay, so we have a start message and a port message structure, and it should be down of oh, this buffer management. Oh yeah, right. This is the header file. That's why it's okay. Back to the call. Let's trace this through again. So you started with uh, manager level headers here. The source. Right, manager open. So this is where we were. During the, this, so we're starting in, this is the open call uh, that, that is made for you when, when the device is, is open with the unit. And here we allocated the memory for our, for our device structure. And we did the initialization here. 
Here's where it actually kicks off the process. So assuming we got the memory for the device you meant, and we populated with the machine type just convenience that we set up the, the, the initial flags on here. We do a, a, a begin process, unit begin process call to kick it off. Uh, so launch a separate process to handle this unit. And so we take a look at that. What this is doing is we uh, check to make sure we got all the libraries and everything we need open. We allocate um, sys object tags for ports, so we obtain a message port to use for this. Set up a start message. Uh, this is a, just a, a way of, of signaling. So what we're trying to do here is create a process, but we need a way to guarantee that that process has been created successfully before we go on. So to do that, we I'll temporarily allocate a, a message port and set up a special start message. And this struct start message, it just looks like uh, a normal has a normal message structure in it that has a pointer to the parent task and a pointer to the, uh, the dev unit, or the device unit structure. So what happens? So we we just declare an instance of one right here because we only need it temporarily. Clear it. So now it's zero set up the reply port to be the message port we just allocated that we're going to talk back to, set the length to be the size of struct start message, and then the, the parent task is obtained using find task null. So that now we have a pointer to the task we're currently running that's going to start that process. And then also we, we provide the pointer to the, the device unit uh, structure that's been allocated in you. So now uh, we move on and actually do a create new proc tags and create the new process using the process name right out of the device structure. We've already set that up. A priority stack size uh, 64 or 64k. That's what I'm using in this case. And then there's the entry point for the process. So it's going to start a new process and say jump into unit enter process to actually get it started. <coughs> so if this succeeded, we have a pointer to our, our process. So we need to now verify that it actually is completed and started before we go on and want to use it. So we do that by using our message port uh, that we allocated here and we do a put message to the message port of the, of the, the unit process message port and uh, with the start message uh, address the initial initial message which is right so that's our that's our message itself pointer to the message so that's gonna right there that's gonna actually the one message port is exactly gonna push a message over to our new process and then we go into a, a while loop here to wait. So while loop true, we wait on a signal. In this case, we're using uh, a control E uh, or a control F signal, break signal, to see this. And we're waiting for either a success, which is a return of a control E signal, or a failure, which is the control F signal response from the new process. So then if the sick uh, break control E equals the signals that we just got from our, our wait uh, command right there was returned here. So we look at what signals were returned, when a message came back to us, what did it find, mask it against the control E. If we got a control E with a response message, then the, the create process we just created is finished creating because now it sent it back. And we'll take a look at the other side of that. So this is now catching the receive. And if it got that message back, now it's, it's actually done. It's the, the process has been successfully initialized, and we can go on. So if we take a look at how it did that, we look at our create process tag. It's going to jump into the unit process, enter process here, where again, take the exec. Here, here's another four instance we'll place that one. And again, so now the process now now inside the new process. So this is the function called by the new process that was just kicked off. It's going to obtain a, a find task. It's going to get a pointer to itself. 
uh, for the process, and this, and this was partially for debugging, so they make sure we got it. And that it's set up. So if, if null is not equal to self, so we got a valid pointer to a task for our, ourselves, our own task, then now inside the process, we're, we're waiting for messages to receive. So on the outside, we created the process, and then we sent it a message. And we went, it went into a, wait, a while loop to wait for it to respond. Inside of this function is what it calls, when the new process is created, it calls this function, which then immediately just goes to sleep, waiting for that start message to arrive. And then when it arrives, here we go, that's a start message, we get the message from the message port, and then we check the size of start struct start message for the length of the message, because we populated that and sending it. So we know, yes, we got a message, we received a message, yes, it is a, at least, this equals the size of the message we expect to get. So we believe it's a start message. And then with this start message, uh, we get the pointer to the device unit, which was handed in the message, and make sure that that's valid. And then we set the device's process with the task that we just have. So now this is saving the pointer to the new process back into the uh, unit structure so that it can then use it later. Uh, then we also set the parent task, retain the parent task, uh, which is creating the unit process, which will signal the parent later when the process ends. And for convenience sake, we're also initializing the exec base and the pointer of the exec in the device unit structure. Now we've gone down to unit initialize, uh, where we complete the initialization of the device unit. And in here, we initialize all the resources that we may need. So again, here's the unit process obtaining its resources for its own use. Open library, allocate message ports, allocate lists, allocate signals. Um, this I just I broke all of this down into the individual ones. And again, this this could be this could be general use, and this could be more specifically tailored to what your unit needs to do. Uh, but it, so it's allocating all the message ports and everything we'll need for communication. And then finally, it gives the hardware an opportunity to init. And this is where we get into the device driver, the, the, the actual hardware layer of the driver and Ethernet in specifically. So we're just going to skip that for right now. We'll go back here to complete the process. So again, we're inside the new processes task. And it, uh, it opened up, it waited for the start message to arrive. And it initialized everything it got from the start message, did initialization of all the resources. And if this came back successful from the function, we succeeded. So it does a signal to the parent task with a control E break signal and say, yep, we did it. Success. And then we go. So we signal say, all right, so any hardware specific initialization that you have not done, you know, you, you could do further here. And then finally, we jump into the unit's main process loop where a message request will be handled until a control seat break is received. Um, and also set up the unit main loop, uh, you know, call to uh, restart the loop. So here we go, and now, now we're doing a do while, and it's, it's just, Manage the run state. It's got. It's doing this this way because there's a possibility that the device is being res, reset or restarted uh, if it stalls. Uh, so if you run into a situation where, oh, you know, maybe somebody pulled the Ethernet cable off for too long and it timed out, and then it has to just kind of flush what it had and start again without. Quitting the driver or reinitial, you know, having to start the whole process from the beginning. It's right there. The individual task of the process will try to recover and just reset itself and keep going. So if that happens, you may lose a bunch of packets and you know, ping requests will be gone or whatever. But it'll pick it up again, and all your new requests will just you know, should should pick it up and go. So that's why it's set up this way, where at first it's starting checking the restart flag because if it actually. Um, gets a reset signal, 
it ends up, it has to check this again. So, um, restart flag, uh, we clear it, clear the reset, restart flag, and then we uh, set the online run state flag, and that's, that's again, that's for lower level use, we know we're actually online. And then this, in this first time start through the loop, then the uh, S2 config interface command has not been received yet. So again, this is set to specific because we're waiting for the next message from the network uh, TCP IP stack to say, okay, now we've opened it up, we've initialized it, everything, now I want you to actually configure the interface, turn on the, you know, set up the hardware. Up to this point, you still haven't initialized the Ethernet hardware. <laughs> you know, you could, uh, writing, you know, a different device drivers, a different approach, you might have, uh, earlier on, when you, when you first got the open, you might have decided that's the time that I just need to set up all my hardware. But to keep it all layered and hopefully reusable, you know, this is where you, you, you would finally, in the, in the processes main loop, or just before it, you know, uh, for the unit, is where you do your hardware initialization. And then go. So in this case, the, the protocol specifically states that it shouldn't go online. It shouldn't configure itself until it says it's going to. Act so the, the client actually requests it. And, and primarily that is, um, this is to support the concept of being able to take your interface online and offline. So it's all completely configured and ready to go, but stop for now, and then I'll start you again. So that's why that exists. Okay, so um, if we, we go into the main loop here, and this the main loop is where you actually end up with all of the message handling. And it, and it starts getting into the command layer um, on handling each task. Now, I don't know if you wanted me to go into that or if you wanted to jump in with your other unit stuff at this point. Because this, this, this next bit. That's just all specific to the driver now. Yeah, well, the, the, well, the, the main. This, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's a gen, there's a general handler for the message. <coughs> but then all the calls it makes are specific. Yeah. Or, or could, be, could be specific. So, so the only thing that's like you know reusable, I think, in, in this case, is you, you jump into the main loop, and uh, you uh, it just ends up taking and uh, setting it up into a while I'm still running. Uh, keep looking for uh, the uh, the signals. So it, you know if it gets us gets a signal, but hey, I got I got to begin I O. I'll call the unit handle begin I O message which will then end up processing the command, break down the message, and decide which command needs to be executed to support. So this is, your, this is really your heart and soul, your main execution loop, ultimately when the process gets on its feet. And it's just wait for messages, receive them, hand them down the chain to the next guy that actually knows how to handle it. And then you know any messages coming back up, same thing, transmit them back up the chain. Until somebody says quick, control C is sent in, uh, and then we just back out of everything. So, and we're receiving data. And then this is set up this way again because if it if it, if it gets a restart flag, it falls out of the main loop, um, and uh, you you get you you start the end process procedure. And again, so you're you're that's why you you, you save your task pointers earlier. So that, just like you said, sent the start message to kick things off, if you're falling through and quitting, now you need to send the closing messages and tell it to go destroy itself. Stop the hardware, dispose all of this, everything it did underneath of it, and then back up, back up, and reverse. So, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it down to that layer. So this is, that's, that's everything from Initializing, setting up and initializing the device uh, as essentially a, a library, so an actual, an actual device, creating, have, have, setting up that main interface layer, creating your uh, separate unit structures and separate processes for handling it, ultimately getting into a main loop of execution and handling your messages until the end of time. And, uh, and after, from, from this point down, is where it really gets into um, 
everything being handed. First, the, the unit level handling the, the processing. Um, then handing it down to the individual commands for what needs to be done. This is a this is pretty much a message for message deal. So you get a config interface, mess back and it gets decoded at the top. Oh, that's a config interface command. Hand it down, we're gonna call CMD underscore S2 configure interface. You know, handle it, it does its thing, you reply to the message. So this it's all this all of this is doing. So you could do this, and I have seen it done that way, but everything jammed into one file. Where all of your message processing is just routines and sections, just you know, cascade everywhere. The idea with this was to try to break it down completely so that you could you really take a look at it and say, okay, if I get this kind of message, this is the code I'm gonna go to. Does this apply to me? For my device driver, no, <laughs> forget that. You know, it gives you and it gives you a template to, to follow. And then the commands, it's at the command layer here that almost exclusively would then call down into the hardware layer. So that's that is hopefully the structure always maintained. Manager communicates to communicates to unit, communicates to command, communicates to hardware. 